Okay, welcome to our follow-up discussion on mechanical properties, focusing on some other details like uh, Poisson's ratio, shear, uh, ductility, and true stress, true strain, and even um, some flexural test work as well as hardness. Um, and we'll end with an example in that category. <clears throat> so we saw last time that the uh, force results resulting on a material acting in tension, for example, re results in strain as characterized by the change in the shape or the length of the material relative to its original length that uh, was measured without any force per cross-sectional area or without any load on the specimen. Um, we know that there is an elastic portion to the curve, which represents the linear portion here um, at left, <clears throat> and then at some point past yielding, or the yield stress point, where the, we register 0.2% permanent deformation once load is released, uh, we transition into the plastic deformation region at right of this linear portion. Other features we know and recognize are the um, tensile strength value, which is the highest data point on the curve, a fracture point here, <clears throat> um, indicating the moment the specimen has um, broken into two pieces, and of course, the slope of the linear portion in the elastic regime at the leftmost data set of that red line that I've tried to draw in there is, of course, the tensile modulus for the specimen. Um, okay, <clears throat> also note um, that, strictly speaking, what we've been considering at this point have been engineering stress and engineering strain values, where everything is relative to the original um, <coughs> Uh, dimensions of the specimen. And we'll evolve that to tr talk about true stress and true strain uh, in this video. Okay, so ductility, the ability of a material to undergo plastic deformation, is related to the number of slip planes. Uh, in metals, the number of slip planes is identified, um, and the most likely slip to occur is the slip plane that has the highest atomic planar density. So that would be close packed uh, planes of atoms where we have uh, a hexagonal kind of arrangement of atoms as we see here. So we've seen these in the face centered cubic lattice and also in the hexagonally close packed lattice for a hexagonal system. And in an HCP lattice, um, there is only one plane that has this uh, hexagonal close packing, and there are three close pack directions characterized by the sort of sets of black arrows over top of the hexagon here. Um, okay, so the number of slip systems there is three for the HCP the product of the one plane in its three directions. <clears throat> so that suggests that any plastic deformation would favor a uh, slip along one of those three slip systems. In the FCC system, where we have a lot of different uh, ways to generate or uh, view close packed arrangement of atoms by considering different sets of 111 planes, uh, we see that there are up to 12 systems for slipping generated by four different planes with that close packing arrangement. And again, those same three slip directions reflecting a 110 uh, direction, for example. <clears throat> so that's how we get to the 12 expected slip systems for an FCC lattice. So given that the FCC lattice has many more slip systems than the HCP and the BCC, which has none, given that there are, is no close packing in that system, we expect the FCC metals <coughs> to be the most ductile and HCP and BCC metals to be less ductile as a consequence. <coughs> okay. Some other topics that we need to consider under um, 
tension type work on <coughs> materials is the idea of a Poisson's ratio. So Poisson's ratio is the ratio of the transverse contraction strain to the longitudinal extension strain. Um, <coughs> and this is characterized prior to yielding, prior to registering permanent deformation. Okay, so we've seen the longitudinal extension strain before. That's simply our length at the moment of measurement minus the original length divided through by the original length. So in this slide here, we kind of term that linear strain. <clears throat> and we can see how that linear strain here is the epsilon that is, of course, parallel to the load direction. If we are applying tensional forces on the te test specimen, this strain that is parallel is along the vector of that force. Okay, so in Poisson's ratio, that's going to be our denominator. So under that moment of linear strain, we might expect the material to respond in the orthogonal direction. So if volume is to remain near constant, we'd expect contraction laterally as a consequence of uh, extending material upward along the load direction. And so we, read, we call this on, on this slide here the orthogonal strain. And of course, it is a characteristic of the transverse contraction that occurs. And so it's going to be opposite in sign because we are reducing the dimension there. If we allow positive direction to be defined as the the gaining of dimensions along um, the, the, the dimension in question, then loss of that dimension will have to be the opposite sign. <clears throat> so in a lateral strain measurement, it's the width of the specimen under the load condition minus the original width of the specimen divided through by the original specimen. This would be the lateral strain. And we use this as the numerator to calculate Poisson's ratio. We apply a negative sign there because that is a negative outcome there. And so this gives positive values Poisson's ratio. So this is characterizing how much contraction occurs as we experience linear strain that is uh, in the longitudinal extension direction of the specimen. Okay. So Poisson's ratios are characteristic of materials, and uh, depending on how the material is, what the what the nature of the material is, we may be able to simply report a one Poisson ratio for, as an example, an x dimension or a y dimension um, when load is applied in the z dimension. Um, if there's anisotropy, meaning that the x, the, the pattern of material in the x direction versus the y dimension are different, we might expect specific Poisson ratio values to align with the differences in the matter along the x and along the y of the material. Okay. <clears throat> so like we suggested in the earlier discussion, uh, these stress-strain curves can be generated under different kind of testing modes. And so we could consider shear, where we, as an example, have a cube of material, and we ask the top plane of that material to displace parallel to that bottom face, and we're going to sort of shift it with a, a shear force, Fs. As that cube of material distorts, we are applying strain to the material, and that is reflected by the delta x that we generate by applying a shear force to the top plane relative to the bottom plane. Okay. Um, now clearly, depending on the interplanar distance of the material, y, we would register different amount of forces to generate the same delta x. So all of that needs to come together to give us our strain value under shear, gamma, so lowercase gamma, 
is our strain due to shear, and it is the ratio of the displacement of the top plane relative to the bottom plane divided through by the interplanar distance of the specimen. Okay, um, You'll see here that by geometry, this is the tangent of the theta, which is the angle at which we distort the sample from its original unsheared location. <clears throat> so this is our definition for the x-coordinate information now, that is shear strain, okay, given lowercase gamma. The um, stress is very similar to what we had before, so the shear force divided through by the cross-sectional area. This time the cross-sectional area is the area of the top plane specifically, and we have that reflected in the diagram here. So lowercase tau is the shear stress for our um, graph. And so at, through those um, um, approaches, we have our stress versus strain curve under a shear test method. So you might expect very similar uh, results there where there would be an elastic portion to the curve and ultimately there could be plastic deformation where permanent uh, deformation occurs. Um, and in the linear portion, prior to yielding, the yield stress for 0.2% permanent deformation, there would be a slope to that part. So this would be G, our shear modulus. So you can see that it is very much analogous to our tensile strain value epsilon or E, E, which was our Young's modulus. Okay, so uh, for shear, this is the modulus of rigidity, G. Okay, um, <clears throat> we bring this up because Poisson's ratio that we've just developed here, which is, again, the ratio of contraction um, in the uh, transverse direction relative to how much longitudinal extension we have, can help us predict and, and see a correlation between moduli for tension and for shear. Okay, so uh, we see that down here. So for isotropic materials, that is that they are uniform in all three directions in their properties and their arrangement of molecules or atoms, the shear and the elastic modulus uh, for tension are related. So the Young's modulus E is roughly equal to the product of two times the shear value on the on, on one plus that Poisson's ratio value, okay? So simply adding one to the Poisson's ratio and then multiplying through by its shear modulus and doubling that outcome gives us the tension um, Young's modulus value. And so here's a couple of uh, values for Poisson's ratio. You can see here they are usually fractional amounts, um, typically less than uh, 0.5. And for metals, the value tends to be uh, quite smaller, around 0.33. Uh, ceramics, um, a little less still, 0.25. And polymers, close to the upper limit of about um, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and with a value for polymers at 0.4. Okay, so hopefully you can appreciate here that not only does the Poisson's ratio characterize how much uh, transverse contraction there would be under tension, but how it can be used to predict a shear characteristic like the modulus uh, for rigidity, G for a shear loading uh, condition. And so you may not necessarily need to do shear test work if you have tensional um, specimen and data that way you can use this relation to predict shear properties.